after. Looks like it's already, it's fine right now, yeah. Hi, everybody, welcome. Looks like we're just getting everybody in from the waiting room and you are in for a treat today. I'm Becky Sullivan and I'm the K-12 English Language Arts Director at the Sacramento County Office of Education. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Tracy White Whedon and Dr. Rebecca Tolson from the Nye House Education Center. Dr. White Whedon is a seasoned leader dedicated to advancing literacy success for all and academic excellence for children. If you were in her keynote just an hour ago, you know she is a relentless literacy advocate who frames literacy as a fundamental human right that transforms the family tree when evidence-based practices are scaled responsibly. I love that. Dr. White Whedon is joined by her colleague, Dr. Rebecca Tolson. Dr. Tolson has a PhD in elementary education from the University of Akron and is a member of the Academic Therapy Association at the level of qualified instructor and certified academic language therapist. She is also a certified dyslexia therapist through the International Dyslexia Association. Their session is titled Dyslexia, Understanding the Science and Proven Instructional Approaches. Thank you for joining our professional learning network today, Drs. White Whedon and Tolson. Thank you so much, Becky. It's an honor to be with you once again. Um, I'm revved and ready to go. I had a, like a five minute break to catch my breath from the last session and I'm ready to jump back in with you right now. So one of the things I want to emphasize as we think about how we frame literacy is based on my experience serving on Mayor Sylvester Turner's um, Office for Adult Literacy. And it's, I believe, the only mayor's office of adult literacy in the nation, believe it or not. And um, he, he uh, partners with the Barbara Bush Foundation because they want a model to prevent adult illiteracy that is transferable in its blueprint to other states. And so being a part of that advisory board has been absolutely fascinating. So for example, in Houston, where I hail from now, one in three adults struggle with functional literacy. Think about that for a minute. One in three. And so for some of those individuals, they never learned to read properly the first time based on zip code, navigating um, schools that were not properly supported to do that work well. And the second is that they're, they're dyslexic. And, you know, there was a time when people used to say dyslexia doesn't even exist. Well, you know, with brain imagery and neuroscience and the, and the um, body of scientific analysis, it's a real thing. And so in this session, we want to talk to you about through the, a robust discussion, Rebecca and I love tag teaming in our conversations with one another. Dr. Tolson serves as our vice president of literacy initiatives nationally, and we even have international projects um, that her team has organized. Um, and she is a certified academic language therapist. I am not a therapist. I'm a recovering high school English teacher and theater teacher, but um, I have learned a lot in leading Nye House for the past seven and a half years. But Rebecca, she has a special education background. She has served children and she still actually provides therapy for children. And she scaled this work in gen ed. So she understands from a boots on the ground perspective what we're going to be sharing today. And so this is about understanding dyslexia. It's about understanding how structured literacy approaches and activities um, are different than some of the things you may have been exposed to. So we're going to look at current research in this um, discussion, but I also like to conceptualize this with the context about what's at stake. So that one in three, for example, in our city and whatever that might be in California, there are implications from functional Ill illiteracy in a digital age that affect access and opportunity, the ability to leverage financial literacy, your contract, et cetera. And then there are other aspects of it 
um, if we go into the next slide, that affect the person's quality of life, and that's health. It's estimated that low literacy and unemployment costs our country $255 billion a year from lost workforce productivity. The results of crime. You remember me talking about the school to prison pipeline, um, the loss of tax revenue. So if we have a bold vision, a collective moonshot about addressing this, part of the big picture is recognizing that a system of prevention and early identification of children with dyslexia rescues them from experiencing reading failure and drowning in a sea of illiteracy when they could have been taught how to navigate the waters of literacy successfully with intensive intervention and support. Huge costs, 238 billion in healthcare costs as a result of low health literacy. We have doctors who wanna support our work because they have had patients who, a, a parents who inadvertently overdose a child and they're broken because they couldn't read the prescription. So think about the generational implications that affect holistically the quality of life for the people that we want to serve who happen to have a diagnosis or, or not have a diagnosis of being dyslexic. Let's go on to the next slide. So it's estimated that 15 to 20% of people in the world are dyslexic. So it's not, I was dyslexic, it's I am dyslexic, but it is not destiny in terms of never becoming fully literate. We can change life trajectories of those that we serve when they receive the proper services and supports. And so when we look at again, and I shared a very similar view of this slide, those who are a part of that 10 to 15%, Rebecca, I'd like to have your take on this slide this time because they've heard me and my take on literacy as a privilege and ensuring that dyslexic students get that privilege. How do you look at this slide based on your practice? Well, the way I look at it, hello everyone. I live in North Canton, Ohio, so I'm Eastern time. So it's afternoon here. It's so good to see you all. Thank you for joining us. Um, you know, when I look at this slide, what hits me is that um, dyslexia is a continuum. And that means that if you don't have to be severe or profound to get services. So only about when you look at this, only about 5% of people learn to read effortlessly. So not all kiddos that are struggling have dyslexia. And some kids that struggle are in tier one or general education that can be serviced there. We're going to talk about that later. But you know, if we look at it, we have to be explicit and intense when we teach most children. Intensive and explicit. And that, Tracy, is what speaks to me here is we need to be doing that for all of our children because most of our kiddos will thrive with that type of instruction. Exactly. And that has been our consistent experience. And it's so fascinating when we work in districts. For example, one of my favorite superintendents who's now coaching others is Dr. Arturo Cavazos. And he was superintendent in Harlingen CISD in the Valley. And he saw that their pre-K students, because they had full day pre-K, um, about 60% of them were succeeding, but 40% of them weren't. And he said, it's not acceptable that 40% are not. And so we planned the work and worked the plan. And they went from 60% to 95% kinder ready. And part of that was through this ability to identify the children who were flagged for dyslexia early and getting reading right the first time through explicit structured in, uh, English, uh, unpacking the English language. If we go into the next slide, I think it's really important to um, recognize one of the things that I do is when we have our adult literacy classes here at Nye House, I'll walk the classrooms because I tell those adults, you're my heroes because they push past the shame of not being able to read to show up and, and, and lean in and learn for the first time. And Lily is one of our instructors who came to us as an adult literacy student. Her language she's loved in, Spanish is, you know, is, her, is the language of her community. But um, on the continuum of being dyslexic, she is mildly dyslexic. But she was so determined that not only did she master but she actually ended up becoming a certified academic language therapist and now full circle works with students in our adult literacy program. 
So it's a very diverse group of adults we work with. Some of them, uh, you know, any nationality you can think of, they're in our building pretty much getting the, the science down pat and, and gaining those skills. So what would happen, I think, often as I work with these adults, if we had prevented that failure in the first place, if they hadn't had to carry around that shameful secret that, no, I'm not stupid and dumb, I'm dyslexic and I have not been served with the proper treatment. So if we can teach adults to read, we can get it right with kids, most certainly. So Rebecca, looking forward to you digging into commonalities. <laughs> Thank you, Tracy. This is a new slide that I um, I got to expose to at the National International Dyslexia Association conference last year in San Antonio, Texas, and I love this. This is from the National Center on Improving Literacy, and the reason that I love this slide is because it shows the various definitions of dyslexia. You can see um, the organization. You can see the dates and you can, they're gonna vary. But what, what I love about this is the commonality. What do we agree on? And we agree on the origin of dyslexia and the origin of dyslexia is that it is a brain-based disorder. And it's a brain-based neurobiological. So that brain, and we're going to look at that in a minute, looks different, feels different, acts different, but it's not a bad brain. But we know where the origin comes from. It's just a different brain. So here's the something else we agree on. We agree on the attributes. And the attributes, so dyslexia is characterized by difficulties in foundational skills that involve the ability to read and spell. It affects accuracy and fluency. So it's that foundational piece where they, they are struggling decoders, they are struggling encoders, but it doesn't mean that it's a thinking disability. So we're gonna unpack some secondary consequences because they aren't able to read independently that can happen, which we'll call the Matthew effect. So we don't argue about the attributes. We know common agreement there. Also, there's, there's common agreement on the instructional factors. It, dyslexia is treatable with di direct, explicit instruction and using structured literacy. So I'm gonna unpack that in a little bit as well. We're gonna go deeper into those instructional factors that matter for students with dyslexia. So here I've chosen to use the um, IDA definition, the International Dyslexia Association definition of dyslexia uh, 2012. It's a it, it's just a common definition. We found it in the Shaywitz's Overcoming Dyslexia and IDA uses it. So I'd like to adhere to this definition, but it's not the end all, which is why I wanted you to have the previous slide that shows some other good examples. But you know, here's what we need to know. You can see it is a specific learning disability. It is categorized underneath. You can identify as an SLD, but it doesn't have to be, like I mentioned before, it's a continuum. It doesn't mean special education services. There are kids that have mild or moderate that can learn to read in general education with the right instructional methods. Neurobiological, we talked about being brain-based and it's characterized with accurate and or fluent word recognition. That's where the difficulties lie that affect decoding and encoding. Now, these difficulties um, typically result from a deficit in the phonological component of language that is often unexpected in relation to other cognitive abilities. So I like to say, when I, when I talk about this, I like to say that that little one will enter kindergarten looking like everyone excited about school. And then when it comes time to learn their letters and sounds, all of a sudden they start crying and not wanting to go to school and they, they, or they struggle. And we think, what happened? Because, you know, typically if you look at their profile, they're going to have average or above average IQ. So it's not about their ability. And it's not about the, it, it, it isn't about, if it's dyslexia, it's not about the classroom instruction. So this, it's like, think about it. The majority of the kiddos in the class are reading, but they, with that program, that instruction, that teacher, but this kiddo still struggles. So the secondary consequences, it can impede, impede vocabulary, reading comprehension, 
And because of the, the re, um, reduced reading experience and lack of background knowledge, because they're not reading as much as their, their peers, because it's hard and they avoid that reading corner. They avoid uh, reading because they're not, they're, um, their skills are lower and they aren't as confident. So when I look at, when I do the definition, I like use, I love, I don't like it. I love using that slide because we know what it looks like in the brain. We know what a typical reader looks like in the brain. And you can see there's three in the non-impaired um, reading brain. FMRIs show us the reading brain that there are three areas activated. And what's important about that is those three areas are important for becoming a fluent reader that understands and remembers what they read. It's not all about decoding. It's about processing the language in a way that I, the yellow here, it's the occipital temporal lobe, which is where they automatize language. That's where fluency goes. So automaticity. So they don't have to sound everything out. It's automatic. If you notice, the, uh, the, the brain with dyslexia only has one activation, and that's in the frontal lobe. And the frontal lobe is where beginning readers read. And you can see that frontal lobe is enlarged. And the enlargement is important because they're actually trying harder in the frontal lobe. They're working hard. This isn't about motivation. This isn't about effort. They're trying. So the, the pathways are not being used that a typical reader uses. So this is where the instruction comes in. You can activate that for a child um, with dyslexia through treatment. So it's um, dyslexia is not curable, but it's treatable, which means, and it's treatable from an ed educational standpoint. So we know we can teach kiddos to read that have the dyslexia profile. Now, a few more slides. Uh, Rebecca, before you go on, one of the things yeah. I want to offer to yeah. participants, we offer a dyslexia simulation virtually. So if you've never had an opportunity, take us up on it, go on our website and sign up because there's something about having that experience. When I had it, um, there was lots of Kleenex in the room and I knew why, and that was face-to-face, -face, but um, boy, did I need a Kleenex after I went through that. And I thought about things I might've said to students like try harder, right? More effort. And they were trying four or five times harder than anybody else in that room. So highly recommended if you haven't had the opportunity, take advantage of it. Well, I love that, Tracy. I'm actually facilitating one in Shaker Heights this evening and through the our, our Ohio, Northern Ohio branch of IDA. And one of the things I agree with you, it's a great experience. I believe every educator, every educator, every whether educator. you're reading, you know, if you're whatever you're teaching, language arts, math, whatever, every educator should go through a dyslexia simulation and every parent. Because yes. a lot of times the parents are thinking, you know, what, why aren't they trying hard? I know, you know what I mean? Like, I know, I know they're doing their homework, but it's just not clicking and it'll really give an awareness. So thank you for bringing that up, Trace. That's a really good, um, good idea for our participants today. Also, um, dyslexia's core weaknesses. Let's keep in mind that these are weaknesses around all of these strengths, so the areas of concern here are we, there's deficits in phonological awareness and fawn means sound. So they're going to have difficulty processing and manipulating and segmenting sounds, which we know we have to, we have to do when we read, right? We have to activate sounds to symbols, but we, which impact our decoding. Decoding is not just about phonics. Decoding is also about um, the language at advanced levels. So it's about Multi being able to decode the multisyllabic words, right? Being able to divide words into parts and understanding uh, prefixes and suffixes and patterns for reading advanced levels. So decoding is much broader, much broader. Phonics is sound symbol matching. There's so much more to what a child can struggle with in the decoding realm. Also in the encoding. So we know that if, if, those, if those patterns are difficult for reading, they're also gonna be difficult, most, most likely for spelling. So the core strengths and secondary consequences according to Jack Fletcher, here we have vocabulary usually, and I'll tell you from my over 30, 32 years of experience in education, is that vocabulary and listening comprehension are a strength. When I tested kiddos, 
When I started, I did pre-assessments to work with kiddos that were struggling. Usually their listening comp and their vocabulary was at or above grade level. Usually, as long as they didn't have to read it themselves, they could answer questions and they could engage and um, talk about it. But if they had to read it, their reading, their understanding, their decoding was one or more grade levels below. So think about the strengths your kiddos come with and then broad language of a broad language of written language. So any kind of language skills like receptive and expressive language, synthesizing skills, the, the, all of that um, would be a secondary consequence, not a primary consequence. So think about what is primary. Is it primary that they can't read the words or is it primary that they're not understanding not um, strategizing, not monitoring. Those are two separate things. So we really have to flesh that out with our students with dyslexia. Now, we do know, we do know early tendencies of dyslexia and I list them here. And these, this is how I am amazed because when I first started my practice over, what was like about 28 years ago when I, I moved into special ed and dyslexia, all of my referrals were fourth and fifth grade. And as, as we evolved in our screening tools and our understanding, it went younger and younger, third grade, second grade, first grade, kindergarten. Now we know, I always said, oh my goodness, e, you don't even need to be a reader. You don't even need to be a reader because you can do rapid automatized naming of colors and objects and say, wait a minute. Their processing is not what at grade level, at age level. So this is, that's a representative of what they're gonna recognize letters. And so all of a sudden, and you can tell with sounds, kiddos with rhyming books at four, absolutely. Can you generate recognized rhyme? And kiddos that showed those indicators were worried. So the early tendencies are those phonological tasks like rhyming, segmenting, manipulating sounds, letter names. I mean, I've had over my practice where I've had kiddos leave kindergarten only being able to name three to five letters out of the alphabet. I'm worried. I'm worried about that kiddo. Their difficulty putting the sounds and the symbols together. B says book. I can say book is a B. And that means that decoding, encoding. That's an early early indicator, and then word recognition fluency. So we know a rapid naming would of, of words, whether they're CVC words or, or patterns, um, regular or nonsense words. It's Those are early indicators that majority of kiddos can do at that age level. So those keep those in mind. We do not have to wait. The sooner, the better. So that's why I, I love this slide by Katz and Hogan that show the windows of opportunity. We, we, don't have, we don't have to wait. We don't have to wait. And I'll tell you, I had a student who I started teaching early first grade and she was a twin. And she would come in, she would come into my office and we worked together and she was at risk and, they, and mom and dad knew something was wrong. It's just got to get them in. We got to get them in. And, and I worked with her for several years, but I'll tell you what, she always said, why doesn't everybody go to Mrs. Tolson? I don't understand why everybody doesn't go there. She never felt different. She never felt like it was a negative. And the reason is she was so young, she was learning to read. She felt it was a positive experience. She just thought that was part of her everyday routine. So here's, if we, if we do what's right for kids in pre-K and one as a prevention model using universal screening, it's just a quick temperature check on who we're worried about and who we're not. We can disaggregate them and then we could go through a, a more of a, um, uh, well, I call it a, a CBM, our curriculum-based measure, where we can say a tier two screener to say, okay, if they're screened at risk, now we need to know exactly where those um, those areas are so we could intervene, we could teach. But if we prevent, we have fewer negative consequences, 
less early reading failure and more cost, it's more cost effective. I have remediated hours and hours and hours of kiddos that were older struggling readers, hours. Whereas if a kiddo is taught in a structured literacy, you can get them up and catch them up in a way that they can, they, they are on track with their peers. Now, Rebecca, we, let's take an advantage of the plasticity of that brain when it's oh, younger. Good so point. let's take advantage of that. Good point. Excellent. You're exactly right. But if we don't do it early, if we don't have a preventative model in place, there are more negative consequences, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. Delayed reading success. So we know they're behind grade level, which means they can't read what their peers are reading and they fall further behind often. And it is it is less cost effective for districts. So it's a win-win for everybody to have a preventative model. And I love this approach. So the economic impact on dyslexia white paper, I wanted everybody to have this. This is actually from California, where from the Boston Consulting Group, if you're not familiar, it's put out in 2020, neglecting dyslexic learning has a huge financial cost to society. Dyslexia will cost the state of California $12 billion this year. So you can dig in to all of the metrics that went into how that was calculated. This is a societal, it's a social issue that needs to be addressed because not only is it costing the kiddos and lies, it's also costing much bigger in our society. And most importantly, it, it, it does affect um, the mental health of our students, so such as anxiety and depression, depression. And this is a resource you hear for you, internalizing correlates of dyslexia. And I just wanna share real quickly, cause I know we have some, we have lots more slide, but I had a student, a second grade student who his mom reached out to me for tutoring. And the day that he got in the van after school and he went to a parochial school and he got in the van and he was so sad. And he was sad because he, his peers were able to read prayers in church. And he got in the van and said, mom, when am I gonna be able to read prayers at church? And mom called me sobbing and said, what can you teach my son to read? And I, I, I said, absolutely, let's, let's get this moving. We can, you know, kids can learn to read, so let's do this. And the first session, he sat down a little second grader and he crossed his arms and he said, you aren't going to be able to teach me to read. And I said, why not? And he said, because you're my third tutor and nobody else has been able to teach me to read. Mm -hmm. Think about that learned helplessness at second grade. And I said, oh, honey, you have no idea. You're going to learn to read. He became an Eagle Scout, a, a, an amazing cross country runner. He learned how to read and he is so successful today. I get goosebumps thinking about it because this is what our kids go through when they can't read. So today I want to give you this, the research behind MTSS, multi-tiered system of support. What does that do? If we have a structure of tiers for our kids, what does that do? I'm going to hit a few highlights because Dr. Whedon's chomping at the bit to, to speak again. <laughs> <laughs> so it increases teacher knowledge about students' needs. What do my students need? Based on a universal screening and a good tiered support system, it prevents reading difficulties because we are a preventative model. We're looking at what they need before they fail. And it narrows the reading achievement gap. There, we can keep them on pace. How does that happen? In tier one, every student should get what they need. They should get a dose of structured literacy, whether they have dyslexia or not. Through universal screen, screening, intervention-based diagnostic assessments, and every student should get that at a minimum of 90 minutes per day of foundational reading instruction, including the structure of the language. 
And I'm going to show you what structured using structured literacy approach because structured literacy is the method to teach kiddos the language. All students get that. You don't have to be in a certain group. You don't have to have a certain profile. Everyone gets the first dose. And Rebecca, I want to I want to note here, if if the pyramid is upside down in the system, and I worked nationally for Scholastic at one point in my career, it blew my mind. I had my HISD blinders on, and then I saw the critical mass of children were at tier two and three in so many places. And I thought, what in the world is going on? I thought it was just me struggling over here in my neck of the woods, rural, urban. It's the same thing. I remember being told when I was leading in HISD, we didn't have funds to help children with dyslexia. We had to deal with tier one. Well, we had a first instruction problem. <laughs> so this is about dealing with a first instruction problem. Then you have more than enough resources often to deal with the tier two, tier three. So I have to interject that real world dynamic. I'm so glad you did. I'm so glad you did. That is so good. I love the term progress monitoring because we're using data to see if what we're doing is working for our kids. And we're not just giving them those, those assessments. We're analyzing to see is the help helping. And we're moving them. If not, we're intensifying. We're changing up what we're doing. So tier one needs to include small groups because every child needs something different. Not every profile needs the same intensity, the same instruction in that skill. So our data shows us what they need through a, a, an intervent, intervention-based assessment, progress monitoring screening tool. So we can disaggregate using universal screeners. We kind of know who needs help and who doesn't. But now we need to drill down to what help do they need? So the, the instruction is driven by the standards. What do they need? And what is the standard? And I'm going to get them, I'm going to get them up to keep them up to standard. It's part of the reading block. It's part of the reading block. So the, the teacher gives everybody a dose and then we, uh, we can intensify. Maybe we need to review. Maybe we need to reteach. Maybe we need to prescribe more practice with a certain area, certain skill, a certain... Um, you know, it could be fluency, it could be um, decoding, it could be phonological awareness. It's teacher led. And I always wanna say the most, ex the most experience in the room needs to be a part of this. It is not, it, it is you, they are the certified. So think about it. If this is my student, my child, and I need that, I need the best for my child, I need the most skilled in the room. So, I, I mean, I, I love paraprofessionals and, and, and I love support in a classroom, but the, the most skilled needs to be with our readers that need help. Why? I would not send my kiddo that had um, some kind of a medical to a general uh, a concern, I, to a general practitioner. I would send them to a specialist to get what they need. And this is where we need to make sure that that's why it says it's teacher led. Now, tier two, tier two is small groups in addition to that first dose. It is still in general education and we're gonna intensify and we're going to be very specific to match it to what our data is saying. So our progress monitoring is going to be more often, we say here at least every other week, and we are gonna have smaller groups of three to five, and we're gonna be more focused with that. Is it reteaching, more uh, review? Is it um, more practice? Do they need more practice in a smaller group and in what area? So all of this is an additional um, instruction in intensity and explicitness. And so tier two is very important. And tier three is also part of general education. It is not special education. Now we're seeing that my this kiddo is showing 45 a need for intervention within the court. And I, I want to go on record saying that kids with dyslexia can learn to read in the core. They can learn to read it with general education instruction with the right intensity. So it may be small groups of one to three that are 45 to 60 minutes a day. 
And I want to say in our primary grades, reading, learning to read trumps everything <laughs> because we will lose them in our education system if we don't teach them to read in K to two. We will lose them. So that means that we have to know who needs what. And we have to know how to intensify. So structured literacy interventions improve the reading achievement of students with dyslexia. Don't believe me, believe my the researchers that show that. So these are studies that show that that is the treatment for dyslexia. And I have those citations and references for that purpose. Tracy, would you like to, um, oh, wait a minute, one more. Yeah. And structure literacy works for kiddos that have, are come from low income backgrounds and English learners. What we need to focus on is all kids need to learn how to read the language. This is about the language, teaching them how to access the written code and understand and remember it. So we're gonna talk about the whole picture of, of literacy here in a minute. So Tracy, I'm gonna kick it to you for a couple slides. Absolutely. I'm gonna keep my eye on the clock here and go through this a little quickly because I did reference biliteracy in the um, English language learner or um, biliteracy. Um, this picture makes me think about Elsa Cardenas Hagen, Dr. Hagen, who is, if you don't know her work, she's an incredible expert on this area and a grassroots activist in Brownsville, Texas, who got the attention of the Barbara Bush Foundation and Barbara Bush specifically, who gave funding to make, yes, she is amazing, Becky, to make structured literacy instruction in the science reading the way that the children of Brownsville would learn to read. It was the poorest region of the country and it transformed things. This was 22, 23 years ago. And do you know they're still our strategic partner, still committed to the work this way? And it's actually in board policy that children will be taught this way. They've had nine to 10 different superintendents, but the work of making sure children have these foundational skills and more never stopped in over two decades. So that's what I mean about on your watch and the butterfly effect. It's just incredible. She, she's one of my sheroes. I absolutely adore her. So when we think about early intervention and research, I referenced the language variation. It, 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 it doesn't matter. <laughs> the science is the science. And so one of the things, again, I have to keep it real. At times, I think there's resistance because of past trauma in terms of how people were affected by systems that were classist and racist. Let's just keep it real. We inherited those systems. We inherited those, but we don't have to feed them at the table and keep them alive. We can push them off of the table and say, you don't have a, a place at the table anymore on my watch. And sometimes... The children we're serving may look just like us. I could be African-American in a school perpetrating male practice. So it's about the value system and about our calling and our purpose and that we will not be science deniers. We're going to be science advancers and we're going to acknowledge the dialect that the students are loved in or the language they're loved in. We will acknowledge the children with children. There are high prestige dialects doesn't mean that your dialect is worse than anybody else. It's just some people see it as high prestige. So we want you to have access to the high prestige and we want you to understand and celebrate your own. And you get you don't have to choose between either or. You get to have both and. So literacy allies look at this as a moral imperative and that it doesn't matter what suit the kid came here in. We want them to have the currency of the 21st century, period. And if they're dyslexic, we understand the stakes are even higher for those students, regardless of the zip code they come from. Thanks, Rebecca. So, I don't know. I just feel like you're preaching it. You're preaching it. I just love it, Tracy. <laughs> Thank you. I just feel like, woo. Um, I, I just love it. I could listen to you all day. Okay, so structured literacy. 
So we say structured literacy works for students with dyslexia. We need to understand what structured literacy is. And this is, this is my sweet spot. I've been doing this for years and years and years, and it works. Don't believe me, believe what the science says. If we teach students the components, this is what we teach, and this is how we teach it. If everything aligns to this, not, nothing on here can be, not, can be avoided. So the components of what we teach are on the left. And if you notice, phonics is one of many of them. And if a kiddo cannot learn to understand and remember what they read, they're word callers. That is not what our goal is. So that means that spelling and fluency and morphology and vocabulary and grammar and writing and comprehension, all of that is equally as important. So it kind of gets under my skin when we start having this phonics conversation when we're attaching it to, because I'm like, no, I mean, that doesn't make any sense because if I'm teaching a child to decode or teaching them sound symbol correspondence, that's, that's counterproductive to the end result, understanding and remembering what they read so they can use it for whatever. I had an adult student who aspired, she was in her 40s, she wanted to be a truck driver. She was, she had the difficulty passing that test to be a truck driver. That was her dream. I taught her to read. She gained five grade levels in reading in one year. So she started out about a third grade reading level and moved up to an eighth grade. We were able to study together for her test and she became what she wanted to become. And that's what's important. It is not about putting letters to sounds. That's not what we're talking about here. So what we teach and how we teach it. So the first thing that I look for is a scope and sequence of the language. Are you teaching all the syllable types? Are you teaching all the sound symbol correspondences? Are you teaching all the morphemes? Is it in a structured way that builds from simple to complex? Is it cumulative? Do you constantly review to mastery? And does the data show that? So it's whole to part and part to whole, that analytic and synthetic. So if I'm breaking it down from whole to part, we have to spell by breaking those sounds into parts and letters and putting them into writing. When we read, we see a whole and we might have to analyze that into parts so that I can sound it out, at, cat. So all of this is based on a delivery model that includes the diagnostic and prescriptive. That's why the MTSS slides are so important. And we Rebecca, Rebecca, I wanted practice. to ask you to add about, you know, I malpractice, I learned to teach comprehension separately from mm -hmm. other skills, and that was not appropriate apprenticing. Could you speak to that? Because you said it's it's all of it. It's, it's all of it. And so at Nye House, I'll use the example because I'm actually uh, presenting at a conference on Saturday on developing metacognitive strategies. So at Nye House, we think of all of these and we have courses for all of these because they all, they're all essential, not any one of them separate. Everything creates a reader. So when we think about metacognitive strategies for remembering and understanding, what we're doing is we are analyzing, we are strategizing, we are monitoring. So how many kiddos get to the end of the page and say, I don't remember what I read. I don't know who the characters were. I don't remember, right? How do you engage a metacognitive and have those metacognitive skills to be a understander and a rememberer of expository and narrative text? And so what we want to do is create specific ways for kiddos to be um, independent with that, just like they would be independent with decoding. So we need to scaffold that for some kiddos. So, oh, I, I highly encourage our, our develop, I'm doing a little snippet on that this weekend and I love it, our developing metacognitive strategies class, because that's exactly what you're talking about, Dr. Whedon. It yes. is about- that it is about systematically and explicitly teaching comprehension like you would teach decoding or fluency or any of those. So, um, and then of course with fidelity. So it has to, you know, we think of structured literacy, any 
structured literacy program or intervention would have a routine that has a specific amount of time for each thing so that it works. That's where the research piece comes in. If scientific, scientifically we say, this is the intensity to get this tier reading on grade level, then that's what I'm gonna do as an instructor, as a teacher. So that's why it's tried and true. So whatever structured literacy routine you're using, it has to be done with fidelity. So Tracy, what do you, what about? This so one? <laughs> this one is, um, well, my refrigerator looks a little better than this right now. I just cleaned it, but I don't know about yours at home. You don't have to fess up, no true confessions. But I think about our profession at times is like this refrigerator. My dog, my eyesight is not really good. I have like Mr. McGoo glasses and contact lenses in right now. So those young people, you don't know who Ms. Dr. Mr. Magoo is. Those of you who have been around, you know who Mr. Magoo is. Okay. So um, when my daughter, I'm a late in life mommy. She's graduated from high school, 18 years old. She helps me clean. I'll have something and I'll pull it out. And I'm like, oh, this is fine. She's like, mom, look at the expiration data. I'm going, I can't see it. <laughs> what is the expiration date? Mom, we cannot eat this. This is expired. Again, NIOS wants to be that shoulder partner so that you can look at the things that are expired and can strategically release those things. Initiative overload comes from when we push more and more on the plate of teachers. And then they were like, I don't know what the priority is here. What is expired? And having the courage to point out those things and the knowledge is extremely important to systems change. So Rebecca, the next slide, I think, sets us up for you to kind of unpack some of that. Yeah, so Louise Spears Swirling, she's um, part of the Center for Effective Reading Instruction. And in her article, which I cite here, um, she lists out the non structured literacy approaches. So if you see these and she's like, okay, so what makes them, what, what makes it a structured literacy and non structured literacy program? So, and I'll pack that. What it doesn't meet the criteria that I just went over what you teach and how you teach it in a systematic cumulative way. So it's really important to understand and understand what, what components will work for kiddos um, and what won't. I mean, and the data shows that. Another that has been disproven is the three queuing model. So what we wanna do is abandon disproven and use the proven based on the science. And so I'm always reading research to show me what is the latest and the greatest we have in science? What are the findings of experimental and quasi-experimental studies of what is what is proven? So Tracy? And, and again, here's this quote I love. It's one of my favorites. I want to put it on a t-shirt. There comes a point where we need to stop just pulling people out of the river. We need to go upstream and find out why they're falling in. And so back to the proven practices, that's a big why they're falling in. So one of the things that I'm so excited about at Night House is that we're partnering with universities to deal with this upstream issue of pre-service teacher preparation and also developing masters of reading programs where our um, curriculum is the delivery system. Teachers, we build teacher knowledge. That's what our nonprofit focuses on. It's not about just the curriculum. They do need a delivery system, right, for that. So how do we teach teachers how to use the delivery system upstream? How do we apprentice and support them to do that? And Rebecca, you might want to reference in case there's anybody, a university partner listening in about what happened in Ohio on your watch with the university partner. Yeah, so we partner with Walsh University in Ohio, and they, um, they created, basically, we have a specialist preparation program for a dyslexia therapy masters. And they basically took our program and embedded it into a university master's program. So teachers can get a master's of dyslexia therapy at Walsh University. It's virtual. So anywhere, anyone in the country can enroll in that. And you can go to Walsh University Dyslexia um, on the website and you can find out more information, but basically they took an accredited, a nationally accredited course, um, and they embedded it into their university. So now teachers from anywhere in the country, even the world can access that and get that uh, master's degree in dyslexia therapy. I'm the professor of record. So, 
Um, if you inquire, you're probably going to be in contact with me, which would be fantastic. So I'm so proud you. of you, Rebecca, because it's the first in the state of Ohio. Yeah, How awesome is you, that? Tracy. Thank you, Tracy. <laughs> so I know we're 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 uh, always always struggling about time, but a couple things when we talk about um, non-structured literacy programs, we what is structured literacy versus typical practices? So um, this goes back to that same article showing us that phonics skills are taught explicitly and systematically. They're not taught um, as and they're they're directly taught, not just as needed basis. Um, it's highly explicit with prerequisite skills using a scope and sequence. So I'm gonna buzz through these pretty quick so we can open it up for a few minutes of questions, but we would see in a structured literacy approach decodable text, that's where that practice comes in. That's where that practice comes in. So they need to practice reading. And level readers doesn't don't does not give them the practice in the code because there's so many um, patterns that they haven't been taught and predictable and predictable text because it's memorizations versus actual decoding. So we want to make sure we've taught them before we ask them to read it. That's the that's the premise behind that. Um, oral reading with a teacher for co uh, corrective, immediate corrective feedback versus partner or independent reading where they can't get feedback. So that goes back to that trained teacher um, being right there with those students. Uh, the simple view of reading we, or writing, we don't want to eliminate any component of the ingredients of language. So anything like reading, writing, spelling, grammar, all of that. So effective remedial and compensatory intervention strategies like spelling, morphology, text structure, and sentence combining, all essential to be directly explicitly taught. Tracy. So I'm going to be very brief. Basically, if you have... Um, access to a university and they're interested in retooling and rethinking teacher prep, we're your huckleberry. Connect us, please. We're very interested. And the science of reading is incomplete without the science of teaching reading. And I would add leading reading. Mm -hmm. The research by Joyce and Showers is very clear in terms of pedagogy and the transfer it's like zero transfer if it's just pedagogy and even practice during sessions, it's the coaching piece. So coaching teachers and leaders is essential for application at the highest levels, which is like 95% according to their research application and transfer to classroom instruction. So I couldn't, I couldn't help but giving a shout out to Rialto Unified School District in California. They're one of our partners. And we've had a um, at least a three-year uh, partnership with them, starting with their um, special education reading, um, creating reading teachers through our specialist preparation program. So they started with um, creating these specialists, and then they went to their general education, and they offered a menu of structured literacy options because we know teachers are are in different phases of life and some can commit to long-term training and some need some shorter terms. So there's, there's a menu of options. All teachers can grow learning the language. And I continue to grow to this day, still taking classes, still learning uh, because you're ne you've never really evolved, but Rialto is on that journey. And I wanted to give a shout out to them uh, today because they've really committed to the work. So Tracy, I know you usually yeah. uh, wrap up with, you're going to do our closure. I'm going to close it out and just say, this is what strategic, this is what initiative overload looks like when change management is not a part of it. And if you have a closet like that at home, again, I'm not going to expect you to fess up here, but you know what it's like to try to navigate a space like this, right? Next slide, please. So the work is about planning the work and working the plan. Any spark joy friends out there who like to watch her? Okay, I see some hands. This is spark joy time, friends. You need somebody who's an expert who can help you say, okay, I got to let this thing go, right? Strategically abandoned. Because if you do, next slide, if you plan the work properly, it's going to spark joy. You'll be able to navigate your system effectively. So that's what we love to do. I love to do because I know what it felt like to be an initiative overload, especially as a leader. 
So the variables you can control. If you look at the cumulative funding loss of students who are falling through the cracks, dropping out, I used to do this nationally when I was with Scholastic, it's astonishing. Millions and millions of title dollars just going down the drain. So if you do that analysis, you'll be shocked about how much funding you can recapture by planning the work, working the plan. Next slide. So first variable you can control, time. Dr. Tolson unpacked for you what that can look like at tier one, tier two, tier three. What are you doing now? What do you, do you need to strategically abandon? What do you need to refocus? So that variable time is maximized to the highest degree. You can control for that variable. Next slide. Second variable, talent. How is your talent organized? Do you have literacy coaches who can come alongside with your principals to calibrate for all layers of MTSS, who can go into those classrooms, demonstrate lessons that are aligned to the science? Friends, you put your money into that, you're going to see dynamic transformation. That's what Harland and CISD did. That's what Brownsville did. It makes all the difference in the world. Matter of fact, we had a leader from a majority African-American school, lowest performing in the district, eighth lowest performing in the state of Ohio. They flew in to see a majority EL high poverty school. That's a turnaround school in Houston. They went back and applied the science, even though the language variety was African-American English, they got the same results. Next slide. Last variable you can control, funding, sorry. What you want is to recapture funding. So if you apply the science and you align your resources and your arrows, you will find you will recapture funding. Rural district we work with that did this work well, that superintendent could focus on enrichment for all in a little bitty rural district. That is where the money is. I mean, that's the money move. So that's a powerful move you can make. And I want to end with this. Next slide. Oops, it might be stuck. Okay, there we go. Ashley Gordon was in our adult literacy program, working with instructors like Lily I showed you earlier. Ashley could not get out of college. Well, she actually, after entering adult literacy with Nye House, graduated. She's now a special education teacher. And she knows how to help kids with dyslexia. That's the family tree at work because her daughter's dyslexic and she knows exactly what her kid needs. This is the vision. I keep Ashley's face in my mind because this is the idea of righteous circles that transform family trees. So I don't know if we have even a minute for questions, but I will stop and just say again, thank you for your service. And I hope you heard at least one big idea today that will change your practice. Yeah, I see uh, a question. Tracy and Rebecca, more than one, way more than one idea. And I can't even wait to go back and rewatch this session because we're recording it because there's so many gems in here. We have uh, one question in the chat so far. It says, can you give us more information on what a universal screener is and how we can advocate for assessments in our schools? Ooh, Great question. Yes. Um, Tracy, I'll take that. So Nadine Gab put together a really good um, a document that shows valid and reliable universal screeners, diagnostic screeners, and um, Ohio, I can speak to, I'm on the Ohio, Ohio Dyslexia Committee where we had to, um, we put an RFP out for universal screeners. Um, we're trying not to miss anybody that needs help in our state. And so we did uh, we did a vetting of screeners and those measures have to be valid and reliable so that you get, you know, as few false negatives as we as you can, right? And so we want to make sure that that kiddos are that we get the kiddos that we need to find. And if kiddos fall in there that and the and that need help, that don't need help, they're just gonna get a little extra instruction, not a problem. So Ohio did an RFP and they put out that list and that's on the Ohio Department of Ed website as to which screener. But I, I think if you look up or if we can get you that resource from Nadine Gab, she does a really good job in this area. She's my favorite. So we really want, and, and you know what? We had screeners in our state that didn't make the dyslexia measures list. In other words, if you're using a universal screener, you also, per our dyslexia law, have to show 
that you're screening for dyslexia. And some of the uh, very popular, commonly used screeners did not make the list. I will tell you that. So we're on our second round and guess what happened? It forced those screening companies to up their game on their measures to so that, you know, because if we're not finding those kids, then it's a problem. So we really, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty happy with the fact that we didn't just take any old screener. We really eliminated ones that were not finding the kids we needed to find. So I think, um, yes, I see, I see some good things in that chat. So I hope that helps. Rebecca, I want to add, if you're in a decentralized district, you've got to decide what needs to be tight and what can be loose. You've got to make some system super tight and seamless because that means some Kids, kids in some schools will fall through the cracks and others, it'll be fine. So you've got to make those bold leadership moves about core decisions like that, about universal screening and such. And we are here to serve as a thought partner. That's right. Thank, Thank you. you. We, dropped, uh, we dropped the um, link to those uh, the screener list in the chat. We hope you fill out the feedback form. We want to make sure you get time for a break and to head to your next session. And again, so much love in the chat for both of you. And thank you. Thank you so much. And thank thanks you. everybody for joining us today. Email us questions if you have them. We're a phone call away or email away. <laughs>